we are ready. Uh, can someone confirm whether you can hear me or not? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. So, uh, just a minute. <clears throat> So uh, we'll start the session, but I'm getting some echo. Are you people getting echo? A little bit some, sir. Okay, let me check my device. Uh, is the eco still there? No, sir. It is now totally fine. It's fine, right? Okay, fine. Thank you. I'm sorry for the goof up. Somehow my other uh, devices were getting repeatedly uh, booted. Uh, uh, so we got delayed. So what we will do today, uh, we have, uh, we thought that this live, in this live session, what we will do, we will primarily discuss uh, some key point that you should know before we end this course, because we'll end be ending this course, we are almost at the fag end of this course. So our eight a week course will be ending, and uh, you know, many of you will be appearing for the final exam, which is for the certification, right? So I thought that it is better to discuss some salient point which you should remember while preparing for these exams, fine? So that is what our uh, uh, primary goals for my uh, today's live session. I'll be, I, I will handle some of the questions that some of you have po uh, posed. I have seen two questions earlier. I do not uh, know my machine is giving trouble. So if any of you has any question, please uh, raise your hand and ask the question, right? We will discuss that. But let me start the session with the first important agenda for today's live session that how should I prepare for the upcoming uh, examination for certification? I'm sure all of you have not uh, registered, only a handful of you have registered. And I expect that many of those learners are there here today. So the first thing, there are three, four things that you have to remember as you prepare for the final, uh, final exam certificate examination. First thing is, please pay attention to the assignment questions. For each of these assignments, right? We have seven, eight weeks, so we have eight assignments. Please go through each question of these assignments, right? So each question you should focus on, you should practice yourself. The solutions are given. So you look into the solution. We are, I'm trying to provide for each answer, I'm trying to provide a legitimate explanation, an explanation that will help you to understand why are you solving this question in a particular way or something like that, right? So not just the question, you read also the explanation. And that will help you to prepare yourself for uh, answering similar question, which may come in the exam, right? So please focus on the assignment, Try to solve them. Many of the questions you may have done wrong. Look back, check the explanation, and see where you have gone wrong, and you try to understand what is has been asked and how to solve those questions, right? So my first thrust will be always on the assignment. Second thing, up to third week, almost all lectures have some question at the end of the lecture, right? And I have also provided you solutions for those lecture questions separately. Some PDF file has been uploaded. You can go back to the portal and get it. Rest of the weeks, many of those, uh, only few handful of them has uh, some lecture questions. Some question are actually overlapping has been asked also in the assignment. Uh, one person, one learner has asked in the forum to provide a solution for the rest of those uh, three or four questions which have been asked in other uh, weeks. In between, I'll provide them. 
But in general, go back to those first three weeks question and look into them. Can you answer them? What is the explanation provided? Try to understand those, right? So this is the second thing you should uh, focus on. The third and most important thing. See, not a single question is asked in assignment and will not be asked in the final exam, which is not discussed in the video. Everything that we ask in these examinations are from the lecture videos. The slides are available to you. The videos are available to you. So please go through the videos and the lectures and the lecture slide line by line and put yourself, think yourself that from which line you will ask the question. Just think yourself, just like you put yourself at my position and try to think that, okay, you know the, uh, this type of question has come from the assignment. So for the rest of the other topics, other content in my lectures, what type of question one can ask? So don't, you know, try to read from books here and there. Focus solely on the slides and the videos and try to understand it. Now, if you cannot understand something, please come back, write emails to me or write on the forum. We'll answer. We try to answer within one day as for most of the question you may have seen. So this is the third important point. Fourth important point for examination is that, yes, there will be questions coming from our programming. No. There will not be R programming available to you during the examination. No, you will not be able to run an R code because it is, this will be online examination. Only thing that will be available to you is actually the question paper, uh, online question paper, and the uh, what we call the calculator, the scientific calculator given by the uh, software. If you have appeared in GATE, you know this type of uh, system, right? So exactly the same system. So there will not be any program that you have to write and run. But there will be question based upon R. For example, we may ask, okay, you have to do this. So what type of function will you use? What is the name of the function? Now, where we'll ask from, we'll ask this question based on the on those uh, lectures where we have shown you R. You go back to our lectures the series, you will find there are lectures dedicated where we are giving R demonstration. Those code has been provided to you. And I hope you must be practicing those code. So you look into line by line into those code, try to understand why those code has been line, uh, you know, those function has been used, those particular argument has been used. Those has been explained in the code itself as well as in the video. So you must have seen in the assignment, we pro ask question based upon the code, right? What type like, okay, if I do this operation in R, what will be the result? This type of question you should expect in the final examination also, right? So this is the uh, fifth thing. And the last most important thing. Remember, as a teacher, I will not ask you a question there which require you know, long calculation, very long, long calculation or something like that, or something which is very complicated and you have to know lots of things uh, you know, to answer those questions. No. There, I am not going to test you whether you are smarter than me or not. This is an examination based upon the, the videos that we have uploaded, the demonstration that we have given. So everything will come within that domain and the question should be always like that from the assignment you must have noticed is that we, as we have a heterogeneous population, people with different background, everybody should get some amount of you know, able, uh, scope to get some marks. So it will be a heterogeneous population. Somebody may be very good in math, somebody may be moderately good in math, but everybody should get some scope to score. That you have to remember. Remember, I am not going to test you uh, whether you are better than me or something like that or not. It is essentially based upon the uh, course that we have gone through, the videos that we have gone through, and the demonstration we have uh, shown. Right. So that is what uh, you have to remember while you are preparing for the examination. I'll repeat again if you have joined late. First thing, check back the assignment. Check back the solutions of those assignments. Try to learn why we are answering those way, those questions in that particular way. And think about if we modify those questions, what type of question can come. Second thing, we have to remember that we will not ask something from thin air or some book or something. 
every question will be asked from the videos and the lecture material, the slides that we have provided. Third thing, check the lecture questions, particularly in first three week, we have lecture questions. For that also, we have provided the solution. Check the solution, try to understand why each answer has been, the question has been answered that particular way and learning. Don't expect that exactly the same thing will come. We may have some twist, but you should be able, if you have understood those answers, you should be able to answer those questions. But fourth thing, Yes, there will be questions from R code. So please learn the R code that we have provided, the demonstration we have given, and the code that has been uploaded. You can download and check. Fine. And remember the final thing, all questions will be heterogeneous to accommodate the heterogeneous population in the scores. And everything will be from the syllabus, everything from the topic that we have done, from the lectures that we have discussed. You have not to go and think about very complicated things. Fine, stay focused. And many a time I see for a very simple problem also, many of you think very complicated way. Don't do that. Try to think that, okay, if a question has been given and two to three minutes has been provided for that, that question must be such that it can be answered by any rational human being in two, three minutes, right? So stay focused on that. Fine, that is uh, the most important thing that uh, 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 we, I want to communicate to you. Now, if any of you have any question, please you can raise your hand and ask. Uh, please uh, be patient with me because you know my one device is not working, so I'm working from multiple other devices uh, trying to uh, accommodate things. So my camera is on one side, my uh, my microphone on the other side, something like that. Okay, so Priyanshi, you have asked her where will the assignments are provided. Uh, I am not sure what question you are asking in this case. For each uh, week, we have assignments, right? You are supposed to answer those assignments within a deadline of one week or something like that. And then after the deadline is over, we are uploading the assignment solution also, right? Uh, so in the portal itself. So if you are registered, can, uh, per, per, have registered for the course, then you can actually uh, look in, you, you must be accessing the assignment. Okay, Rishnita, please suggest a book for final examination. It is the most difficult question you have asked, not for final examination only. See, there are hundreds of books on uh, data analysis, machine learning, statistical learning, right? The problem is these books are of different type for different people. For example, there will be a way, there are lots of, at least I can name 10, 12 books which are very good which are math heavy. That means they give details of mathematics or typical thing or something like that. So if you are coming from a background which can handle them, those are fine. There are certain other books which gives nothing just like instructions how to do the job. For example, you will get many textbooks for biostatistics which are dedicated for biology people, uh, biology students who have never done much of the math. And these are essentially instructions book. Okay, if you have this type of data, do T-test. And how to do t-test? Okay, you, have, you need this thing to calculate, divide these things, and you will get a t-value and something like that. If you look into the course that we are going through, it is between both the end. One end that we will not talk any principle, any rule or anything, the basic concepts, will only teach you the technique. The other extreme is that, okay, we will teach the basics, the concept, right, and the mathematics. We have tried to make a balance between these two because we have a heterogeneous population. Some people are really interested to know of the, the concepts and some amount of the mathematics, whereas some people are finding them struggling to do that. So we have tried to make a balance. Now, suggesting a textbook which will cover these two things is difficult. Even then, we have suggested some books in the course portal itself, you see including that there is a very famous book which is online and freely downloadable, which is for statistical learning or machine learning, where you will get regression, you will get uh, machine, you know, classification, clustering, all those things, including some R codes also. You can look into that. But trust me, none of this is required for your examination. For final examination, I will insist Please don't waste your time looking for this textbook, that textbook, something like that. 
stick to the videos the videos that we have uploaded and we have uh, also provided you the pdf files stick to those read those pdf files line by line try to make a meaning of each those line look into the videos if you cannot understand something post question if you find that i am delaying in answer in the forum you get back right email to me directly you can easily get my email id on the web right but stick to the videos stick to the pdf file of those lecture slides stick to the code that we have demonstrated and focus on those for your exam fine is it clear now rishmita yes sir okay assignment 5 question 3 why minus uh, can you please uh, read the question i don't have the access to the question right now i think yes, it is about sir. What Which of the question? following values of coefficient of determination indicates a good fit of a linear equation to data? The options okay. was zero point one. Yeah, I got it. I, I remember. Thank you. As I remember. You have, now. As you have said in the course that the uh, it varies from minus one to plus one, and the options were given among them was zero point eight nine and minus zero point nine nine. So I thought that minus zero point nine nine was a better fit than zero point eight nine. Because it was closer to minus one, but it turned out to be. Uh, yeah, I got it. I got your question. Uh, so please look back into the video for co uh, coefficient of determination. Coefficient of determination is r square, right? That varies from zero to one. That always will vary from zero to one. and you can look into the video and the slide and the explanation has been given why it should vary from 0 to 1 there is something which gives a indication about linear relationship between two variable also that is actually correlation coefficient pearson's correlation coefficient right pearson's correlation coefficient varies from minus 1 to plus 1 but in this question we are asking about coefficient of determination which is written as r square in short that will vary from 0 to 1 right not on the minus side right so this minus 0.99 cannot be a coefficient of determination value is it clear yes sir yeah it is i will repeat this question again if you anybody is hearing i have seen this confusion many a time and myself also when i was young and learning this thing i used to also get con co uh, co confused very frequently with this r square and correlation coefficient remember please everybody should pay attention these are two different thing r square the coefficient of determination is coming from linear regression and we have explained in one video why we are writing it that way and it varies from 0 to 1 correlation coefficient also capture linearity in data but that is a different thing please don't mix it i had also mixed earlier when i was early in my student you know learning those thing as a student please do not make the mistake thank you rishmita for raising this question yes guys you can unmute and ask hello sir Yes, guys. Can you switch on your uh, camera? Uh, At least, uh, if, if if you can. Sir, actually, I have some okay, network no issues. No, no, so no problem. Can no, I share problem. my screen? Yeah, whatever you ask the question. Sir, I will share a uh, share a screen. Okay, share it. Sir, is it visible? Not, not till now. I'll wait for a few seconds. Maybe network issue from your side or my side. Sir, I, I have another question. That yeah, is what is the question? The screen. Ah, uh, this question. While in the lecture, I clearly remember that you told that the variance inflation factor when it uh, when is ten or over than that, then. it is considered that uh, problem of multicollinearity really exists in the solution but what yes. the but the question was uh, that the solution you provided i have gone through that and you solved it mathematically 
but uh, as I have also searched the internet, but there also have written that the, as a sample, if the VIF is five, at least five or ten, then they were considering that the problem of multicollinearity exists in the region. So I was confused if can it is uh, explainable because the minimum value we have called mathematically is coming down. Yeah, actually, 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 we were asking in that question where the VIF value, just like the earlier question you asked that. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, coefficient of determination has a range, right? Lower value and upper value, right? So, so in this case, we were asking specifically that uh, what is the minimum value of VIA possible, right? Now, uh, yes. that is why it is zero. Hope it is clear to you now. Now, for everyone also, I'll raise, this is again a more important uh, question. See, remember, if we ask this type of question, VIA, all these things where, there can be two type of thing, and you don't get please confused. See, one type of question could be we are asking the extremum, right? The possible things. Whereas another thing could be based upon what is the value for a good fit, what is the value for a you know multicollinearity. So in that case, you have to look for those values. These are two different questions, right? So please read the question carefully. What is the word being used? If it is said that okay, what is the Cut up value to choose multi decide multi colonality based upon VIA. Okay, your answer will be the cut up value should be ten, something 10 like that, right? If I remember correctly, I must have said that in the lecture. So that that question itself should be very clear, explicit, right? And uh, uh, just to remind everyone, see when we write a question, particularly for multiple choice type thing. We actually go through this question repeatedly, reading, you know, try to understand. Will people make a wrong meaning of it and then, you know, the whole question will be in trouble, right? So please read the sentence very clearly. We try to go and get it checked by multiple people that, okay, it is not, you know, confusing sentences there. We make it, try to make it as much as information given and made it clear, right? So read the question very carefully what it is asking. Okay, uh, uh, Gayatri, are you there? Can you ask the question? Yes. Yes, sir. See, even if you cannot share the screen, you can tell it here. I will try to answer. Or if you have something which you have to show uh, without that, you cannot, then you can send it to me by email also if required. Sir, is it visible now? See, actually, your screen is so small. Can you just tell me what is the question? Uh, sir, it's from assignment. Uh... Five question mm -hmm. number four. Based okay. on the experiment data, we hypothesize uh, hypothesize that the growth of a pea seedling depends on the soil uh, salinity and moisture content. We want to perform linear regression to find the relation between the growth of the seedling and these two soil factors. We are using linear algebra to perform the regression. How many elements will be there in the coefficient vector for this problem? Sir, answer okay. is three, but sir, I am a little bit confused. I don't know how to solve it. Okay, 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 fine. I got it. I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you. See, actually, yeah, I have opened the solution. Solution has already. Uh, this is question Even, number. Yes, which, sir. Question number four, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, question number four. And you have a... <coughs> Please give me a minute. Yes, sir.
Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, can sir. Somebody? Yeah, okay. So see, this is a problem where I have three variables, right? One is, is the growth of the sibling, and I am using G as for that variable, right? And salinity is S, and moisture content is M. So in this case, the G, the P seedling growth, whatever you have measure weight or something, is we believe it linearly dependent upon S salinity and moisture content M, right? And uh, so what we have to do, we have to actually perform multiple linear regression, right? So in this case, what we have to do, uh, I'll write the equation to show you. This machine is. Can you see my whiteboard? Yes, Hope sir. you can see. Yeah. yeah yes. So what you have, suppose you have G is a, a function. It will be suppose A will be a term constant, right? And then it will have uh, B1 into salinity plus B2 into uh, suppose M, right? M is the, uh, other, the other one that we have, right? Other variable that we have. So oh, oh, uh, maybe I'm using some other uh, symbols. The symbols maybe used there is different, but it doesn't matter. So suppose I have a data. So data is, uh, so for, first I have a table. And so this is G, this is S, this is M. Remember, this is my model. And what I am doing here, so first, the first reading is, salinity was S1, the M was M1, and G is G1. Fine, you have measured that. Similarly, second was S2, M2, and G2. In this way, suppose I have uh, N data point, which is obviously N data point must be greater than uh, 2 plus 1 in this case, because I have three unknown. A, B1, B2 are unknown, right? So uh, I, have, I must have at least four data point. So it is better if we have more, much more than four. So the nth reading is suppose GN, SN, MN. So if you, I do not know whether you have followed the linear algebra based method for regression. If you have missed it proper to understand properly, please start it from linear regression with one variable, simple ordinary linear regression where we represent y equal to mx plus c in a matrix format and do it. And then we move to multiple linear regression, right? I assume you have understood that ordinary linear regression of y equal to mx plus c. So now, if you have yes, understood, sir. how can I represent this data in a matrix form? I can represent it this way. See, I have a multiple linear equation. I have g1 equal to a plus b1 s plus s1 plus b2 m1. Isn't it? Because a, b1, b2 are constant. The variable are S1 and M1, and when I had S1 and M1, my reading was G1. So I can write this equation. Similarly, I can write G2 equal to A plus B1 S2 plus B2 M2. Similarly, in this way, I can go on, keep on writing, and I can write Gn equal to A plus B1 Sn plus B2 Mn. Fine. So this is the data represented in the equation. Now, this simultaneous equation, I have n simultaneous equation. I want to represent them as a matrix. So obviously, I'll take this first. So this will be my dependent variable. So I can make a vector g1, g2, up to gn. This is my vector. I hope you can read. My handwriting here is very bad on the whiteboard. So I have a vector g1, g2 up to gn. That is my dependent variable vector. Okay. Then what are the unknown in my equation? My unknowns are a, 
A is here. These A's are unknown. Second unknown is B1, which is there in all equations. B2 is the third unknown. That is also in all equations. Now, how can I represent the right-hand side of the equal to sign? What I can do, I can make it like this. I can write S1, S2, dot, dot, up to Sn, M1, M2, dot, dot, up to Mn. Then I put 1, 1, up to 1, all n number of 1. And then I multiply this matrix. So I multiply that matrix with, I have B1, B2, and A. Now you do the multiplication, you see what you have? This first matrix, its dimension is n by 3. And the vector is 3 by 1. So by multiplication, I should get n by 1 vector. This is also n by 1 vector, right? So my right-hand side and left-hand side has the same dimension. So if I do this multiplication, if I do this multiplication, I'll get back these simultaneous equations that I have created from the data. So this is, we can put some name. This is my dependent or uh, dependent vector, right? Or outcome vector. This is what? This is my data vector, the data matrix of independent variable. And this is my coefficient vector. Right. So what we are asking in this question, what we are asking in this question is that how many elements will be there in the coefficient vector? Obviously, the coefficient vector will have three elements. And you have not to do all this calculation. In any linear regression, in any linear regression, what you have to check is that how many coefficients are there? Remember, if there are four independent variables, there should be four associated coefficients plus one intercept term, constant term. That means four plus one. So if I have k independent variable in my linear regression, whatever type of linear regression it is, if I have a k independent variable, right, then what we will do, we will actually have k plus one coefficient to be calculated. So in the coefficient vector, I should have those k terms, k plus one term. Is it clear now? Yes, sir. Understood now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, Rishmit, if you are done, you can put down your hand. Uh, somebody has, I'm sorry, I couldn't, uh, okay, I enrolled for the course, but until now I have not received any email for assignment and lecture. See, uh, if you have enrolled for the course, you should be able to log into the course page and you should be able to see all the uh, uh, lectures, uh, you know, with a tab on the left hand side where you have the assignment and everything listed. You get emails when you have signed in and you have ticked for that assignment, email should come to you. Possibly, if you have not taken, uh, those announcements will not come to you. Otherwise, you are supposed to go back and check every week because the, date, you know, we, the timetable is all, always with you. If you have registered, you should be able to log in and see all those things. Right? And uh, in every assignment page, those assignment deadlines are also written. Announcement for each has been made. Those assign announcement email does not go sometime in your mailbox if you have not. Take that that you have you want the assignment you know announcement email should come to you. I hope it is clear now. Sir, where to get the PDF or video? He said I am I do not want to be the slides. He have mentioned that we should get to the PDF or video. No, no, PDF or videos mean essentially PDFs or PDF of those slides. The videos cannot have a PDF, right? Okay. Uh, I have a uh, Hari Prabhu. Let me read you a long question. Okay. Uh, Hari Prabhu has a very interesting question. I believe he has posted the same question in the uh, Google sheet. Hari Prabhu, are you there? 
Are you hearing me? Okay, let me repeat if you may not be here or online right now. Hari Prabhu asked a very interesting question. Although it is not within the domain of this course, this the question he has posed is, is actually a, a question which should be posed always in any statistics course like biostatistics. If you go for uh, biostatistics is not focus of our course, but still as in the first week, we have discussed some amount of statistics. And if you are learning statistical learning, machine learning, data analysis, you should have a you know, very good background in statistics itself. So I'll answer this question. So the question is how sample size affects the in inferential statistics. I hope most of you understand what is inferential statistics, right? So it can be discussed. In fact, I can have a whole lecture and uploaded that into YouTube maybe. But you have to, I'll cut, cut it short and I'll try to answer this intuitively. Essentially, what he's asking that how come the sample size can affect from my inferences or conclusions that I draw from my statistical analysis? Let, let me give a simple answer first. See, we have to remember always, whenever you are doing data analysis, you have to remember, as I have said in one lecture, is that Every data that we collect is corrupt data. There will be always noise in your data. That's the first thing. You cannot collect data which is noise free. You cannot have in principle. The noise may be low and you may sometimes you know, do not care about it, but in some time the noise can be high and you have to care about it, but noise will be always there in your data. The first thing. Second thing is that one important issue is that we never see the real population. Whatever study you do, you may be doing gene expression study, you may be doing you know, uh, physiological parameter you are measuring in a population, you are doing some crop analysis, you have to remember every data that you collect is sample. Even if you have hundreds of replicates, still it is sample. You never see the population. And if you remember, we have a slide on that also, discussion on that also, right? So we have to remember, we always have data on sample, but our question of inferences, something that I want to calculate, that I want to extract of, and I want to conclude is not about the sample. It is about the population. If you are doing an experiment of drug-related thing on a population of 100 patients, are you trying to draw conclusions for 100 patients? Or you want to extract a conclusion for all the human being, you want to draw the conclusion for all the human being, not for your sample. Suppose you have done collected some data, you have done some survey on election result. How many people will ask the question in the survey? 2,000 people, 3,000 people. But do you want to, to conclude about what these people voted for or something? Or you want to actually make a conclusion about the whole population's voting behavior, the voting result? So we always, in all these cases, we want to make an inference about the population from the sample, right? So how should I move it? So that is what actually the major trouble in statistical analysis. And thankfully, we have something called central limit theorem or something like that. And from that, we know that as we increase the sample size, I mean, how many replicates or something there in the sample, that helps us to increase the confidence on our statistics, the numerical value that we calculate from the sample data. Let me give you two examples. The first example, suppose you are measuring blood pressure of some normal human being. And what you have done, you have called, uh, suppose you are doing PhD and in your department, there are uh, 20 fellow of your, your age group. So you call them and measure their blood pressure. What you will report, you will report the mean. Now remember that mean value of blood pressure is the mean of this sample of 20 people. It does not represent the mean of all the population of that age group. No, you never saw that all the population. You will never do the experiment for all the population. So what you are doing, you have a sample mean. Now from central limit theorem, we know that if we increase the sample size, this sample mean will be much closer and closer to the real population mean. And remember, you want to know the real population. 
So if you increase sample size, you know you're, you're confident enough that it will move towards the real population mean, which you do not know. And in all these cases, when you calculate the sample mean also, you calculate a confidence interval. And in this confidence interval is something, suppose mean is here, and the confidence interval is in both this side, right? So confidence interval is something like this. So you know that with some percentage of probability, the real mean, the population mean, exists in this interval. In this case also, if you increase the number of sample or sample size, this region will become smaller. That means it will be closer to your sample mean. The population mean will be somewhere closer to sample mean. Take the second example. In linear regression, I have asked you to do, uh, calculate the confidence interval for each of the coefficient. They are also, if you look into the carefully in the mathematics, you'll find as we increase the number of data points, right, from three to four to five to 30, our confidence interval becomes smaller and smaller. That means our estimate for this parameter will be much better with respect to the popul real values, the population values. So that is why you should have as much sample size possible. Now the question is, how much is sufficient? There is no such thing that large is the, is the, the particular value of large mean real large. It varies from experiment to experiment. It varies from type of model you will do. It varies from statistics to statistics that you will apply, statistical tests you will use. But sample size matters. And there are you know, extensive things like the power analysis or some power test of a test or something like that, which are not in the domain of this course, by which we can actually make a rough estimate that what should be a proper sample size for a particular type of experiment with a particular type of statistical model that we'll use. I hope I could explain this. Uh, uh, this is a long discussion. In general, the thumb rule, as I explained, the more is better. The sample size, bigger the sample size is better. Uh, we are almost at the end. So uh, there is someone who has raised hand. Shobhroto, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, I have posted a question in the forum also that yeah, I uh, cultured with a, another data uh, that, that is drug one and drug two and drug uh, with a control one. So the yes, problem, yes. problem is that in the regression analysis. I have I seen it. I have seen it. I have seen it, Shiva Broto, and it has been answered also. Have you seen the answer? Yes, yes, sir. But it is not, uh, I have not got it totally. Yeah, there are two issues that you have to remember here in this case, right? Yes. Uh, one issue is actually see uh, possibly you have truncated the data from somewhere and you have uh, chosen any of the variable as uh, uh, one of the dependent and independent, isn't it? Possibly that has been done in the data. So what you have is actually this independent variable, they have correlations. Right. And if you do to calculate VIF the way we have shown, you will see the VIF is very high. So uh, I will not go into details of the mathematics. In this case, actually, you have to remember that when you have the dependent variable, independent var independent variables, the predictor has correlation, right? You may get spurious result because in principle, you are not supporting a multiple linear regression. You are not supposed to keep the uh, uh, depend, you know, you, you are supposed to keep the maintain the linear independence between these variables, isn't it? So if you fail to do that, your for some data set you will get a very unstable answer. That is one reason. The other reason is actually I missed to say that in my lectures also, although although I have seen a shown an example where we have a uh, you know intercept equal to zero and we are doing F test. Actually, with intercept equal to zero, and if you do F test, that can also give erroneous result. So usually in many places, people will tell you not to do F test if you are you have intercept equal to zero, right? And possibly both the problems are there in your data. So it will, uh, the uh, in the example, it will find when the when uh, intercept is not zero. Yes, that's what I'm saying, because in the F test, your Argument for null hypothesis is all the coefficient for the predicting where predictor variables are zero, right? Yes. 
and then if you set the intercept equal to zero, then the outcome is equal to zero. There is nothing else. Nev left, isn't it? So usually in these type of cases, you are not uh, supposed to actually use a test, right? Uh, when I was giving the demonstration, I have given an example where you have intercept equal to zero and I have shown the f-test because it was easy for me at that time to show the data set was small, but it is not a good practice to do also. Okay, sir. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, I have five, six minutes left. If anybody has question asked, I will take one thing. Priyansi Jain has asked, is it necessary to learn Python for data analysis? I will always uh, you know, advise you to learn Python, not just Python, as many as programming languages you can learn. Remember, if you have learned one programming language by heart and you have developed that algorithmic mind, then learning a new programming language is not so difficult. Only the grammar and the syntax will change. But the core structure, the way we actually break down a problem in a program will remain the same, right? But uh, it is true that a large number of ready-made uh, data analysis libraries are available in Python, particularly in case of machine learning. And uh, so if you are fine with learning it, I'll always advise you to go and learn uh, Python. The question is, which one should I learn? Which one the industry asks for? It actually does not have a specific answer. Uh, it depends how you want to put yourself in the industry. It varies, and even in the industry, remember you have to keep on learning new things continuously. Otherwise, everything will get obsolete in a time. And if you ask me from the academic viewpoint, believe me, we do not run, you know, write codes in one, one language. We actually uh, uh, keep on hopping from one language to another, depending upon the problem. If I see there is a, some ready-made code available library for very good library function made by someone for a particular problem, but it is in Python, I will use that. I will go and use that. And for that, I may have to dig into Python uh, books and learn a bit Python better. And sometimes I will jump into MATLAB. Sometimes I will use C because there are very powerful C libraries also, right? For if you are working on differential equation and all these things. So we in academic side also, there is nothing that you, you have to know this language and these languages you should not learn. These are all you keep on hopping, right? So as many as language you know is good, but you have to remember the criteria, basic criteria is you have an algorithmic mind. You know how to break down a problem into an algorithm and step-by-step -step solve the problem in a program. Sir, while uh, doing the uh, regression method and creating the plot, I have seen that before adding the line, you, you are, are storing the, the result as, as a vector. vector. Then, then you are adding the line. I mean, I mean regression, regression line into the plot. Mm -hmm. Am I able to make you understand? Yeah, uh, but, but in Excel, I have used Excel so far mainly. But the line appears just with a click. But in R, we have to store the data separately as a vector. Then the line is appearing. Why can you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I will tell you. Uh, this is not just a vector. If you want to do something simple. And believe me, many a time Excel is better to do. Right? Uh, but then why should I use R? Okay, you have to remember Excel has not been created. Please remember it, very, very important thing. Excel has not been created for uh, you know scientific data analysis and visualization. Their main target, the target audience for them, the market is primarily is actually business, corporates, right? So in that case, the data visualization is suppose market analysis and all these things, which does, which if you look into the tools available in Excel, you'll find more, they are focused more on that. So they also need some time regression. But remember, if you do that, you can add the line, but you cannot do so much of statistical analysis that I will do if I need to do a simple regression in, uh, you know, for biological problems, right? All those confidence interval, calculation, cal 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 all this. So you have to understand that what is your purpose? If you just need an immediate plot to see a line plot or some scatter plot, which just to visualize immediately, not for publication, nothing like that, you know, Excel is fine. 
But if you want to create a publication grade image where you know you will edit multiple things, you will add multiple layer of information, right? Then actually Excel is not a good idea. You can go for there are commercial software which are dedicated for scientific visualization. You can go for them. Many people do that, and in publication and papers that you see, people have used them. Otherwise, if you are not comfortable of buying those, you have to fall back on visualization by R. And there, yes, you have to do lots of things because it is a programming language. It is not a ready-made software with a GUI where you simply click. So this is the first thing. Second thing is, if you are in a business, academic or non-academic does not matter, where you generate lots of data and you have a large pipeline of data analysis, which you will re redeploy, repeatedly you will use, right? Then Excel or even the commercial softwares are not good. In Python or in R, I can actually write this whole notebook or script book where I will have blocks of different uh, codes which will do a particular type of transformation and visualization. And I can use it for a trunky project where, you know, rna -seq data will come, genomics data will come, multiple sources of data will come. Everything will get in integrated. I can share the code with my collaborator. They can also run it. You can use it for next project. And every time you can create publication great quality images, right? If you're doing this, R is the best one, right? Even your commercial software will not help. So you have to decide where you are. So if you ask me, I keep on hopping. Suppose something body has just bought a, a simple result where a few gene expression data is there. I just want to see. I'll open in Excel and make a bar chart. I will not go in R and plot it. Suppose I have to create a bar plot with a very review, you know, with prop, uh, you know, I have to change the font of things and all these things. You have to make it publish, publication grade. I leave Excel. I have some couple of uh, you know commercial software purchase. I'll go and use that. But if I have to do a large scale analysis, which I'll redeploy repeatedly, one after uh, you know one data set with another data set, I'll leave that commercial software. I'll write the code in MATLAB or R because then I can redeploy it and it will be a trunk keyword. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, so I think we have already caused the time limit. Uh, uh, my goal of this uh, uh, today's live session was primarily to update you and inform you that how you should prepare yourself for the examination, the final examination. I hope you have uh, heard that and please stick to that and prepare yourself, right? And uh, Best of luck for your examination. In between, if you have any question, please shoot the question. Write it on the forum. Then it helps everyone. Other people also get help from that. If you are shy to post in forum, write to me directly. You will get my email ID on the web. Just put my name and search. You will obviously get it. Right? Post it. Ask the question. The best thing that you can do as a learner is asking questions. Right? So please keep asking questions, keep learning things, and best of luck for the final examination. Thanks for joining the today's session. We'll end it today.